You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Well, hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Today, we're going to dive into the realm of customer experience, uh, a part of the external, which is what I think everybody focuses on, but uh, I want to camp out on the internal. And that is, once you define what you think you want to do to uh, employ or engage your customer journey, your staff has to be on board and they have to be making their own individual contributions to that. So my guest is a lady named Stacy Sherman. Uh, Stacy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, she is all about doing uh, customer experience right. For those of you that will be watching the video, she's got her T-shirt on that, that champions that. So, Stacy, tell us a, first a little bit of a backstory on kind of your journey to get to this place and why this is important to you. Mm. The backstory, there's personal and professional. So the bottom line is, I've been living over a very long time life of as an employee in corporate for 25 years in the corporate space, not really being or feeling valued in all my different jobs, um, seeing my peers wanting to be loyal, but yet things get in the way from them really succeeding and being empowered, yet they want to deliver a great experience for the customers who pay the bills for them to be there. Right. Um, and I also have personally in my lifetime uh, have gone through the word is abandonment. And so if you take my personal story and you take my professional experiences. I am such a diehard on loyalty and there's no reason for bad experiences and it's in our control. So I've made a, a life around it. And one other thing is that customer experience has become a real field. It's not just customer service as people have traditionally called it. It's much bigger than that. And I fell into the field having grown up in sales and marketing. I see. Well, uh, great story. And, and as many of us who are uh, doing this kind of coaching and advising, we have our own personal journey that has fueled our passion for wanting to make it right with others. And uh, I, I, I like what you said about employees not feeling valued or I guess maybe another way to say it, the corporate walk wasn't aligning with the corporate talk. And, uh, you know, uh, that is, is such a huge element. And one quick thought I know on episodes past, when I've had guests talking about creating co company culture, one thing that we inevitably bump into is that when you try to define a brand and you say you want to represent X, Y, and Z out in the market, if your culture, that is the people that are doing the, the how every day, if that doesn't align, the culture doesn't align with the statement of purpose out in the market, you'll never be able to deliver on it. Alignment is huge. And I'd like to talk a minute about prescriptive of that. Be, how do you really drive the alignment? Because I think people intuitively know that. I think people already know that company silos exist and it's everywhere you go. But what do you do about it? Doing CX right? How do you actually really fix the problem if you're interested to talk about that? Yes, please do. Okay. So... Journey management is the word I want people to remember. Words, two words, journey management. And what I mean by that is bringing people together from different parts of the organization and having them in a room on a whiteboard and literally map out the customer experience, put yourself in the customer's shoes and literally map out how does a customer learn that you exist, your offers exist. How do you learn 
which is typically marketing. Buy, it could be e-commerce, retail, other. Learn, buy, get, use, pay, get help. Get help is customer service, which we know is very reactive. And have everybody literally define those touch points, those moments of truth, those moments of interaction. And why that's so important is because it gets each person who has their department and has their goals really understand the domino effect of where one role begins and one ends. Because guess what? The customer doesn't care what department you're in. They have an experience with your brand. And if one part breaks, forget it. They leave and sometimes they don't tell you. Right. Well, that's exactly something that I'm going through with one company right now. We have had a kind of a, a resetting or re-leveling of definition of how we want our customer experience to exist. And that's exactly the process that I'm leading the group through now is that sort of blocking out, you know, each of the departmental or siloed elements that come together. And on one hand, this this group does a pretty good job because it's a relatively small company. But on the other hand, we know we've got customer feedback that says, I'm confused. I don't know where I am in my journey with you. And I, somebody needs to help me. And one solution that's being put forth is uh, they've agreed to create kind of a concierge desk of guiding the customer through the journey and having that dedicated cradle to grave contact point that is your end all be all. If you've got any question like that, you know, here's, here's your agent to guide you through this journey. And while the handoffs will happen to get others involved, uh, if the message is going to be, if you ever feel confused or stuck, call me, I'll take care of it for you. And, mm. and the other concept that's being implemented with this concierge desk is, is outbound outreach efforts. We're tracking the customer journey in an internal system. And when we see a customer starting to lag, because there's there's a timing sequence to the, this particular journey, if we start monitoring and seeing the customer lagging, this, this concierge is gonna outreach and say, hey, uh, hadn't seen you around in a while, hadn't heard from you, or is it all going okay for you? Where are you? What do you wanna do? Yeah. So one of the things that um, having worked last year at a BPO, an outsourced contact solution, the agent experience, the customer service agent experience, we know that role has such high attrition. And so I created a LinkedIn learning course that helps leaders, which doesn't apply just to call center agents. It applies to all of your, your workforce and how is it that you keep them empowered and feeling valued so that they don't leave back to that loyalty and abandonment <laughs> challenges in the workplace. And so I think it's important people to understand, for example, creating a community for your staff where they can get that peer-to-peer -peer education because here's what happens. If you don't create that community, they will go do it on their own. And so in Facebook, I've seen the company I was working at, they had those agents went on Facebook and created a private community. And I was in the headquarter role at that time. And I tried to get in because I wanted to know what are they talking about? How, what are their pain points so I can make it better? They would not let me in. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So that is my message to you that it, as a leader, you've got to create and facilitate that community because you will not be led in. And that's worse, not being in the know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I like that theme or that idea. And it is unfortunate it evolves in that, but that's fundamentally what 
leadership is there to do on all aspects of the business because if you allow a vacuum to be created, a vacuum of knowledge and information about what's next, what's the right thing, wh where are we going, if there's anything in doubt about that, your employees will definitely fill the vacuum with their own thought. Yes. Now, with that said, I want to caution your listeners when we talked about journey management. While I am a huge proponent that bringing your employees and stakeholders from every single department in the room, that representation in the room, do not stop there. When you create that journey of all those different touch points, and don't forget communication touch points because that's a lot of failure points, you've got to validate it with real customers to make sure that what you designed actually meets their needs. Yes, yes. I like that. And and this goes back also to just fundamental product or service development. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurial uh, founders go out to market with what they're convinced is an ideal solution and an offering, but they've created a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And they spend a lot of time and money trying to create a market for it. And the market itself is saying, eh, that's cool, but I, that's not what I need right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, in, and yeah. yeah, if I may add just one other point. And, and for a startup entrepreneur, when you start getting that feedback, you've got to be careful about the temptation. Customers or prospects, I should say, they're not yet customers, but prospects will say, I like what you're doing. That's not exactly what I want. What if you did, you know, you think you're doing X, Y, and Z. What if you did A, B, and C for me? It's it's related, but not quite. And the entrepreneur that's hungry for revenue will say, hmm, okay, we'll figure that out. Yes, I'll do that for you. And now all of a sudden you're off target or off in, a, in another direction. Now, the one caveat there is what the if what the market is telling you consistently that they they want the ABC thing, not your X Y Z. Well, then maybe that's your opportunity, and maybe you should ditch X Y and Z, go do A B and C, and and you'll have a winner. Yes, so that's why we're talking about customer experience, but it's fueled by the internal staff. And so if you're an entrepreneur, you might say listening, well, I don't have a staff. I don't have anybody that really needs to be part of my my workshop here and, and walking in the customer's shoes. But I'd say, yes, you do. Because if you are working with a developer for your website, if you are working with a virtual assistant, if you are working with someone who's handling your finances, right, the bookkeeper, whatever it is, that's a team. And everybody has to understand how they affect the customer experience. So I want those that to be known. It's not just about corporate environments. Right, right. You know, um, now, excuse me, I'm shifting gears a little bit here. In, in your bio, you've got a, a theme of blending heart and science, if I remember the phrase right. Tell us a little more about that. Yes, yeah, so in order to get customers and keep them. And we know keeping is so essential because it's <laughs> has a long lifetime value and worth uh, every penny to put your money and investment and thoughts and time in that. There, there's My model is really around both the heart, the emotional intelligence, the humanizing business, as I call it, and those tactics, not just the data. Most companies are focusing on the data and making decisions just based on data. They're looking at just the quantitative results without really taking into effect the why and the qualitative aspects. And so I'm saying you got to blend them when you're making your decisions. You've got to get to the heart. Why are people making their decisions and so that's really what I advocate for 
and in everything I do. I, I personally like that because I, I certainly follow a little bit of a holistic belief in my leadership development work I do with clients because, and, and what that means in, in my context is you have to meet people where they are because guess what? The primary contact you've got in the world is another human being. And whether that's an employee or a customer or a vendor or a supplier, or whatever, that relational aspect of it. So the, the heart element is very, very critical. And I agree with you. Most certainly the bigger companies all get very data centric and, and they say, well, that's a segment of the market I don't need. So let them go and you know, there's a quick write off like that, but um, it, I think it is important to, to include in, in equal, if not greater proportion, that hard aspect of it. What's this fellow human being thinking, feeling, doing that related to what I'm trying to accomplish? So I want to give an example of this. I worked in the elevator industry and I never thought I would, but I did spend many years there. And think about a customer, a rider in an elevator is stuck. So what happened? They pressed the button and it went into our call center and a customer service agent would get all the facts and then get a technician to show up on site and fix the problem. Now, what's important here is the empathy of the agent talking to the individual or people stuck in the elevator. Some of them are like me, claustrophobic. An AI talking to those riders, not going to work. No. Right. 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 And, and think about the amplification effect of that elevator, the property that you're stuck that property manager, right? If they're careless in keeping up with that elevator maintenance, like there's a whole trickle effect here. So I just wanted to point out that AI is a shortcut for many things, but not everything for sure. Well, <clears throat> that is uh, definitely a, a critical factor that people need to think about if you are out there entertaining AI. And if you are a follower of, follower of my show, we've had several segments on AI, and the best experts that I've been able to bring have themselves said that, that AI does not replace the, the human element in it, the, the empathy, the feeling, the connection. And try as many might to, to build bots that are fueled by AI, powered by AI. There, there's still, if you've ever seen any of those demonstrations, there's still an incredibly shallow feel to it. You know, you can you can even try to close your eyes and say, can I imagine this voice is a real human being? And so far for me, anyway, my one man survey, the answer is no. You, there's something about the ability to create tone and inflection in your communication. To your point, the call center respondent to the trapped elevator writer, just in, even in the tone of the voice, you know, if somebody is being empathetic with you or putting you off or dismissing your problem. It, it's a, it's a real deal. And, and I agree that it's, it's such an important part of how we're going to do this customer experience. Yeah. Now with that said, I want to give you another perspective, a little bit opposite of the angle here, which is I do recommend AI to help with training. In other words, there's some tools I've seen, one in particular I really like, where it's an AI simulation and an agent or a salesperson or whomever can practice with the AI before they actually talk to a real customer. And here's the biggest point. They can practice safely, psychologically safely, where their boss won't see the results of some tests in the simulation until they want to share that. And so they can get comfortable and build their confidence. 
And that's a beautiful use case of an AI. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. And because it is the, the, the various role plays and everything, uh, similar to that, and what you're describing, I'm aware of a uh, training tool that is used in the trade industry, like plumbers and electricians. There's a, a virtual simulator that is AI powered that, you know, you put on the goggles and, and you're, you're getting this virtual simulation of a technical problem in the field. And you actually are using your own tools to fix and repair this problem as it emerges. And the AI brain is is watching and tripping in, for instance, if uh, if you cross a circuit, if it's electrical, it's going to give you a short or a spark or something in the mask. It, it's not real in front of you as a spark, but it, it shows up in the mask that way. And you know you did something wrong, and so now you got to back up and do it over again. And it uh, it's an incredibly powerful training tool in that way. And it, you know, on a relative cost basis, it's much more cost effective than having to build a simulation library or a laboratory, I mean, and constantly resetting the physical parameters of your training. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, again, from the elevator industry, working with some mechanics, um, I would do ride-alongs with them. So I put myself in their shoes because I've never been a technician and really going through the day in the life with them, installing and fixing elevators and gosh, what a dangerous job. And so absolutely there is that element of being able to use simulation and practice without having to really put yourself at risk. So we're talking about physical risk, but we're also talking about mental risk in both those scenarios. Yeah, I like that. Well, let's, um, let's cycle back to the customer experience part of where we started. And I'd, I'd like to go back to that uh, that whiteboard blocking out the flow idea. Uh, talk to us a little more about things to consider when you're trying to do that. Some might call it a process map. I, I like, in terms of customer experience, I like the journey map. I, I like thinking of it that way. Yeah. So the journey map, I want people to understand that's just a tool. That's a visual tool that everybody gets on the same page that they could see it and feel it. And don't confuse that with journey management because journey management is really that omni-channel, holistic, so many elements to it. But the journey map is a tool that helps you map that out together. And I say, you know, start back of the napkin or a whiteboard, clean slate of really how do does your company offer the ability to interact with you at those different points of interaction, how someone can buy, learn, get, use, pay. And when you get into that, don't stop because it customer needs are changing. And as you do more of that, you'll realize you can actually get more sophisticated in that experience mapping because then you bring the data in and you can really see what the data says as well as the feedback at those points and then be able to really make impactful decisions and changes uh, across that journey. Yeah. You know that um, the front end of, of your map, as you've described it, uh, and, and pardon me, I'm going to have you repeat those steps that you've got. You've got the learn what, 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 <laughs> what are these steps again? <laughs> yes. It's how they, your customer is going to learn about you. It's the awareness and learning, which is really a lot of marketing, typically yeah. sales and marketing, learn, buy e-commerce? Are they going to buy from you on retail? Is it from your sales force, right? There are different ways you can buy and how easy or difficult is that? <laughs> uh, get, use a product, right? If it gets shipped to you or you're going into a store and you got a new phone at the store, are they helping you use it? Are they transferring your data 
to be able to use your new phone versus your old phone, right? What's that experience? So how easy is it to use what you got? So use a pay. Oh my gosh. If everything else goes really well, but you have a billing problem that you can't get resolved or there's an unexpected fee and it wasn't transparent up front, you're going to be so mad and that might deteriorate you buying again. So that whole pay experience is huge. That's why I say to finance people who say, Stacey, I don't have a CX job. I'm not the front line. I said, oh, yes, you do. You have a big CX job. And let's talk about that. So, and then get help is your customer service. It's chat, it's phone. And so those are at high level, important touch points. It makes perfect sense to think of it that way. And and boy, I'm betting anybody listening to this can think of a specific example of, of where they they ran crossways with that process with a, with a company. Um, <clears throat> thinking of it in your context of those steps, I, I'm thinking of a journey I had with my phone company, my mobile phone company, and I'm not going to name names. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. But I went in to do an upgrade and I was very happy about the process to get. I had the device. The agent was incredibly helpful transferring everything, activating, getting it all set up. But then before I could get out the door, they attacked me basically, not physically, but verbally with sales pitches for other services they offered. And I'm like, you just busted the bubble. I'm real happy about my phone that I got from you. But now all of a sudden you've tainted my whole view of this company and what we're getting ready to do because you're trying to grab me at that point. Now, in my humble opinion, and, and I get why some strategists told them to do it that way, but I can tell you as a consumer, I was not happy to be accosted you know, on my way out the door. So I'm going to give you another lens to this because I worked in telecom at two of the big players uh, for 15 years. And so here's a reality and it's not just telecom. <laughs> Going back to silos, you have an e-commerce team. So people buy online and pick up at store. Well, the people that you bought online get all the credit. Now you come to the store and they don't get any credit, right? It doesn't help their bottom line revenue. So they have to find a way to upsell you because they don't get the credits on. So that's why I say, if the teams don't work together and have common goals, you, the customer, are going to feel it. Yeah. Well, and and that's what I said. I, I get, I can only imagine why they stri uh, structured the process that way. And it, it would be easy to sit back in a corporate headquarters office and say, hey, our customers are already in the store. Why don't we hit them up for this upsell? And, uh, you know, but again, I had already been there about an hour going through the transfer process. And, you know, that seems long in retrospect, but at the time it was fine. And I, again, I was incredibly excited and happy that I had this new device and I was going to go skipping out the door, right? And then all of a sudden I get, I mean, I mean, I almost literally had my pathway blocked by this agent that was trying to talk to me, you know, and it's like, no, we're not going to do this. <laughs> well, here's another uh, perspective in terms of retail. And it's a pet peeve of mine tremendously. And that is I'll buy something. I'll go to the local store. It was shipped to me. It doesn't fit. I go to the local store and I said, hey, can I change it, refund it, pick something else? And they say, no, you need to return it back online. And I said, but aren't you the same company? Sorry, you have to send it back. But I'm in the store right now. Why can't you take it back? I'll pick something on your rack. They, they act like they're different companies. And that, again, is because nobody really mapped out the customer journey and overseeing the omni-channel experience. And right. so that's painful <clears throat> to me. And on that note, I, I think you can argue that's why Amazon is absolutely crushing it with their customer-centric strategies. 
And regardless of who the supplier of your order on Amazon may have been, 99% of them have a return policy that's instant. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to do anything. If you're dropping the return off at a UPS store, you get instant credit once it's logged at the store. They're not waiting for the package to be received at some terminal somewhere. They're, they've built the system to track the the shipping label and they they're trusting that you put the good in the the package and i know another whole discussion about who abuses that system but for for the honest ones of us that are out there all we want is our money back because that thing doesn't work or isn't the right size and we're going to go buy something else that keeps the experience flowing and it's like you know, I got satisfied. I, the thing I ordered didn't work out. I want my money back and I'm going to reorder, but you know. Yeah. Well, you said the most important word of everything you said, which is trust. Yeah. And trust is what makes us keep coming back to Amazon. Right. And that's huge for retention and that's huge for acquisition. So yeah, trust. And that trust is created by the company staff. It's not a company building. It's not a company logo. It's the people. Right. Agreed. Well, Stacey, this has been great. And I think we're about up on time here for this episode. So thank you so much for sitting in with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And before we exit, uh, tell everybody the best way to get a hold of you. Yes. So my website is doingcxright.com. And I'm on every social media, spend the most time on LinkedIn. And check out my course on LinkedIn Learning about doing customer experience right through agent experience. Um, and my podcast as well, Doing CX Right. And so I love the conversation and, and thank you for being here. Well, that's great. And as always, folks, uh, we will have those links to Stacy's contact info in our show notes. So please hop down uh, wherever you may be viewing this or seeing this. And uh, on that note, I do like to remind you, we do have a video version of this over on YouTube channel by the same name. Hop over there, check out the archives, leave us a comment, give me some feedback, or uh, I'm willing to entertain your suggestion for new topics, new guests, anybody you may want to recommend. So with that, we're going to say goodbye. Go out there, make it a great day. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.